Hey, everybody. Daisy, when I asked everybody earlier if they had any personal connection to Alzheimer's, I sort of felt like you put up both hands and <laughs> legs and it all went up. Uh, that There was that much crime. How, tell us your story about your connection to the Alzheimer's world. Well, my, mom's, my mom got diagnosed at the age of 55 with early onset Alzheimer's. And shortly after, I, her doctors came to me and asked me if I wanted a, to get a genetic testing done. And I did. And I have the genetic mutation. And as I understand it, many, many others in your family have had this, that this has been a recurring condition. Yes, 75% of my family has passed away or has Alzheimer's right now. How, how when, you, when you received this news, how did you react? Did it set you back? That moment, yes, it was devastating. But the next day was just like a normal day for me. You know, you, you could either be depressed and not face it or take a stance for it and do what I'm doing now, advocating. You know, one of the things that uh, I know about Daisy's past, and I sort of dug into, is she used to run a very successful sports bar. And as she told me, she ran a Cubs bar in a Cardinals town. Uh, yep. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that it was very successful. And you gave that up? Yes, to care for my mom. It was either put her in a home or take care of her. And I wasn't going to put her in a home. So as you deal with taking care of your mother and you're dealing with, I, I also... Um, no, it's why you're here today, and we're so grateful that you're trying to push the needle on other things. What, are you, what do you want us to know about the experience, and what should people in, in your situation be doing that they may not be aware of? Well, for starters, you know, caring for your parents is not an easy task, I, mm. yeah, obviously. But, you know, you take, a, you know, you take it under your wings, and you just do what you can the best that you can. Right. And, you know, every day if she's eating, if she's getting her diapers changed on time, you know, you don't have to worry about bed sorts because you're, you're the one caring for her. So if she does have it, you can't blame a facility. So my thing is with everything is advocacy work, caring for your loved one, um, advocate, you know, get involved in clinical trials. You know, that's, that's how we're going to find so a cure for this. So take us further on the clinical trial front. Is that, is that something you've, um, that you're, you're, are you in cl cl clinical yes. trials? I'm in the Diane study out of Wajoo University in St. Louis. Um, I've been in it this, this November will be my fourth year. And so do you talk to other people in similar condition? Do, is there any sort of support group network? One of the things George Fradenberg um, talked about today, it was, sort of struck me was uh, he has a patient oriented organization or sort of, you know, around the person. And I'm interested in sort of constructing what that, what that actually means. Um, what is what is important to you as a as a patient and a uh, participant in these clinical trials that's not there right now? Well, <laughs> just let it you know. Just criticize somebody. Just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just wish that you know there was more funding for mm. for clinical trials. I wish that more people were involved. Um, I've talked to you know senators, governors, and there's people out there you know in the in the offices that are dealing with the same thing I'm dealing with. Their loved ones are going through the same thing. So I'm not the only one. Um, Alzheimer's doesn't have a, a barrier. Gay, right. straight, Latino, has, you know, black, white. It just, you're going to get it, you're going to get it. When you're, when you're you know, in the, in the process, and I'm sort of looking at this question, I'm glad you mentioned the gay community, the straight community. We have somebody talking about the African-American community, women, uh, and, and a disproportionate um, burden in, in some parts of, 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 of these sectors uh, that is part of this. But is it within your own family and your own community, is it hard to talk about this? With my family, it was at first. I was right. the first one that took a stance for it. So it's taken, my grandmother had 11 siblings. All 11 of them died with Alzheimer's. So my mom has six siblings, including herself, and three of them have passed away. Well, two of them have passed away, and two of them are living with it, including my mom. And then the oldest and the youngest do not have any signs of it as of now. So, you know, you just... I, I took a stance for it, and now my family now talks about it. But they're not involved in clinical trials. They're not. They're not involved in no movement with Alzheimer's. They support me, but that's about it. I read uh, in one of the many interviews you've done, and and the film you've you've participated in, um, that you have your mom's um, 
teaching pension in part, and then you do some hourly work here and there, but it's just a financial tsunami way of hitting oh. you. Can you share um, with whatever you're comfortable, can you share with us a little bit what that world is like? Because I don't know what the financial picture, I know it is more on if you walk into an emergency room on the wrong day, you can get a bad bill, but what is like living with this all the time, the chronic, chronic dimensions of cost? Well, my mom was a teacher here in Chicago for 29 years, a teacher's aide for 29 years, and her pension, now moving to Springfield, the cost of living is way cheaper than out here, obviously, and her pension to them is too much money, so I don't get any kind of help. No, she doesn't, she's too young to have Medicare or Medicaid, whichever one it is, I get mm. confused with both of them, but she doesn't qualify for any, any kind of help. Um, so I live off her pension, and then my sister owns a restaurant, so I work part-time at her business, and live off tips and my hourly wage. And, you know, it's not easy, you know, but you make the best of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Other people are having it worse than me. You know, just sort of, um, as I'm trying to understand this world and whatever, one of the things we've been trying to do in the conference today is we had a politician up here, you know, member of Congress who believes in science and investment in science. We have people in the different scientific community, people in kind of uh, storytelling and story saving, memory saving, if you will. Um, and I'm interested as you look, at, you know, because you've become an expert that we're all talking to, as you look at the ecosystem, what do you think needs to be, I mean, I had to put it this way, disrupted? What's not, if you were to be put in power of changing any of the dimensions that we've talked about today, what would you shift? Wow. I would get more help for also for this disease. We found it, we found a cure for AIDS cancer, what's going on with Alzheimer's. I mean, it's been out for years. That's very powerful. So. Well, with that, let me open up the questions and comments from the floor. I will pick on you. You know you have a comment. Can we get a microphone? Microphone right here in the front. I like the front row people. This is Darren. Oh, excuse me. Hello, I'm Darren from Medellin, Colombia, and I want to wish you well in your treatments and your courageous approach toward uh, combating this condition. Um, I wonder what, uh, what are you trying to do in your life to, because uh, I, I like the idea of an ounce of prevention is more impactful than a pound of cure. Mm. Um, and whether it's uh, detoxifying your life, uh, exercising your brain as much as your body and keeping a healthy approach toward life. And, and do you think that's going to make the difference for you and super good luck to you? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, honestly, I live my life the same way. I, I do the normal thing. I work out every morning. I go to the gym, but I don't, I eat the same thing. So yeah. I eat junk food all the time. It's not good to say, but it's the truth. Um, I live my life the same way. I just work out more. I do. Before I was working out two, three times a week, I work out every morning. So Daisy, so. can I take this one more further step just to, because I found such an interesting approach that um, we, we want to know what your secret sauce is to dealing with this. I mean, I read comments that you went from the knowledge of what you wanted to know from being uh, a victim to feeling more powerful in this process. So what is the secret to that? What's the secret from going from victim to feeling as if you're more possibly in control? Honestly, I never felt like a victim, even though people do say you are a victim. I just have my faith in the Lord. Everybody has their own faith. Mine's in the Lord. And I just stay positive, you know? Yeah. And I just wish, you know, in my part, I do more advocacy work. I, I love working with us against Alzheimer's. I mean, that's a good organization to advocate with. Um, I just stay positive. I mean, if I get negative, it's not going to get me anywhere. So... Fascinating. Any other comments, questions? Yes, right here. Well, you have two. Right in the front. We've had you before. You're in the same organization. You just got a shout out, so sorry. Uh, right here in the front. Hi, uh, Doug Williamson. I, I work for a pharmaceutical company um, called Lumbeck. Uh, I, it's not so much a question. I'm sorry. I just really wanted to kind of, you know, uh, applaud you and recognize your courage for the work that you're doing for advocacy, but also for, for participating in the trials. It doesn't look like from the photographs you're a great fan of getting blood tests done. I know, I know the Diane study. I think it's one of the most important studies currently going on in terms of advancing our knowledge of Alzheimer's. And I think, you know, you could have just kind of gone into denial and, and, and you know, just waited to, for whatever would happen, happen with this disease. But instead, 
I think you've decided to kind of, through a lot of personal sacrifice, have scans, blood tests, and a lot of investigations and cognitive tests, which are unlikely to benefit you directly, but are an enormous benefit to the field. So just thank you very much. For thank you so much for your comments. So now we will go to the gentleman I cut off. Sorry, right there. No, no, you go ahead. Um, earlier we heard, and Daisy, you know this uh, very well, that while Latinos are one and a half times more likely to develop Alzheimer's, they're extremely underrepresented in research. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work to advocate for the Latino community specifically uh, in participating in research? Thank you. Great question. Wow. Um, he wants you to talk about yourself <laughs> and how great you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just do it because I, I don't want... If I could change in every speech I give, if I could change one person that's Latino or African-American to get involved in clinical trials or to speak up and let their voice be heard, then that's a difference for me. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll leave it there. Daisy Duarte.